Um, we've been looking at uh, clustering criteria, single linkage, complete linkage, and probably while we were talking about these, you have already invented half a dozen others in your head. And uh, actually, there is a nice uh, summarizing formulation. And I've pulled up the original paper here because it's one of the shortest that I've seen. Yeah, it starts here and it ends there. And then, okay, there are five references, but it's, you know, it's essentially a half-page paper. <laughs> um, and uh, it is uh, called today the Lance-Williams algorithm. Or the Lance-Williams formulation, maybe I should say, of agglomerative clustering. A pseudo code looks like this. We initialize uh, we initialize distances i j like so, and then we repeat we find that a new pair <coughs> ij is maybe I should put a star here or something. Um, this is the shortest distance we currently have on offer. And um, then we uh, create a new cluster. Which comprises both I and J. And we delete clusters I and J. And then we update the distances to the new cluster. And now comes the interesting bit. Um, so the distance between any um, cluster K and the new cluster IJ is going to be an alpha 1. No, I'm going to write alpha. Yeah, it's fine. So an alpha 1 times the distance between K and I plus an alpha 2 times the distance between k and j, plus a beta times the distance between the old clusters i and j, plus a gamma times the absolute difference of the distances There we go. I was hesitating with the indices here because alpha 1 and alpha 2, they can also actually depend on the clusters. Um, but this is it. And now we need these uh, coefficients, alpha, beta, and gamma. And um, I have them collected somewhere. So these are the formula from this shortest paper ever uh, that you've that you've seen. Um, it's just a bit uh, nicer, uh, layouted a bit more nicely in this paper by Nguyen and colleagues. All right, and here are the coefficients. So we can obtain single linkage clustering is the statement. 
we can obtain single linkage clustering by choosing alpha 1 as 1 half and uh, alpha 2 as 1 half and gamma as minus 1 half. Ah. All right. That's maybe a bit uh, puzzling at first sight. So I want to motivate why that is. So I'm going to show it here just for the single linkage case. Um, in general, if we have uh, two, num two real numbers, A and B, and we're considering uh, the absolute, their absolute difference, this is the same as the maximum or the larger of the two minus the smaller of the two. And we can rearrange and say the minimum of A and B is the maximum of A and B minus their absolute difference. And now apply to our case here. We're interested in the distance between cluster K and the new cluster, which is a combination of I and J. And this is to be the smaller of the distance between K and I and the distance between K and J. So this is the single linkage clustering rule. And now by uh, virtue of um, this equality that we've just seen, um, we can also write that as the maximum of d k i and d k j minus their absolute difference. All right, and now I can say this is uh, one half times twice the thing. Yeah, so I could write uh, here um, this is the minimum, right? And the other thing is also the minimum. So I'm adding it here. And because I'm having the quantity here twice, I'm multiplying with one half in front. OK, but now I have. Um, the minimum of the two distances and the, excuse me, my notation has, um, no, it's fine, it's just I need a bracket here. Excuse me, my, I slipped a little with the subscripts here, D, K, J. <coughs> Um, so I'm having twice the quantity, so I'm multiplying it with one half. And, and what we have now, here we look at the smaller of the two, and here we look at the larger of the two, and we're adding them up. But because one must be smaller and one must be larger, I can simply add them up here directly. I'm saying this is dKi plus dKj. And then I need this last term here dKi minus dKj, their absolute difference. So the minimum plus the maximum was <coughs> this here. All right, and if we now look back at this formula that we had up there, you see we have the one half 
of this distance plus one half times that distance. This is the one half, the one half times the first distance and the one half times the other distance. Beta for this formula is zero, and uh, the gamma here is minus one half. So we see that for this particular choice of alpha, beta, and gamma, we get out single linkage clustering. Further up, the last line of the table. Not the last line above, the above the table. Okay, so and I made a mistake here. Which one? The absolute value should be dkj. Thank you very much. Dki, yeah, dkj and dki. Thank you. Good. So this was for single linkage. A very, you know, the same argument holds if we use complete linkage. Um, then one of the criteria you probably made up in your mind already is the average linkage criterion. Um, where, well, that's pretty straightforward, right? We uh, consider the average distances, so hence we only need the alpha 1 and alpha 2 term. Um, and then again, more interesting, um, we can also have weighted centroid or weighted median by, by using uh, this beta term there. Yeah? So um, the upshot is, that uh, here in this uh, Lance-Williams formulation, what we get is uh, a single algorithm for all standard linkage criteria. If we just wanted to do single linkage clustering, we could implement this more efficiently than that algorithm does it. But if we're interested in trying out various linkage criteria, then it's nice if we just have to code it once and debug it just once. Yeah. So this is one advantage. And in particular, um, we can now interpolate different criteria. by interpolating these coefficients. Yeah, so in, in that sense, we could say that, I'm scrolling back up. Um, in that sense, we could say that here, if we interpolate between single linkage and complete linkage, um, I'm getting out an algorithm which is called weighted linkage. Yeah? Because the gamma, the, the gamma cancels and the alpha and the beta remain. And uh, you can you know, consider these as, as extreme cases and you can now take convex combinations of these different clustering algorithms, which I think is quite nice. And that means you could potentially also learn these parameters. If you do, if you do have uh, partial annotations, so if you know for a few examples on your data that they should or should not be the same cluster, um, then conceivably um, you can uh, you know, play with these parameters and maybe even you know, not just play, but uh, learn them um, to make sure that you get a clustering criterion which satisfies the partial annotations that you have. Okay, any questions for Lance Williams?
All right. <coughs> then I will allow myself a small excursion. Um, namely, how to apply agglomerative clustering on signed graphs. This connects to uh, last week's lecture. Um, we were talking about the multicut at length. And for that, we were trying to partition a graph which had both positive edge weights and negative edge weights. And um, Alberto Bailoni, who is a PhD student here in physics, um, he um, decided to try and uh, do sign graph partitioning, but with an algorithm that is much cheaper than uh, the multicut uh, that is so computationally hard. And um, I here have a few figures from his upcoming paper, which currently is on archive. And I have not copied everything here, unfortunately. Um, All right, so let's look at this. Um, you've seen uh, you know, this kind of data. The task is to partition it. A neural network um, gives both attractive and repulsive interactions, both uh, very locally and also at some finite distance, horizontally and vertically. Um, so after the CNN predictions, you get a signed graph. And now you can uh, apply a variance of agglomerative clustering to the sine graph. And uh, what I find interesting, or, or uh, what, what you can see nicely when you use such algorithms in computer vision, is how differently they behave. Yeah? So here, for two different criteria, he once uses the sum linkage criterion and another time the average linkage criterion, which sounds you know, extremely similar. Uh, average linkage criterion is the sum criterion, just you divide by the number of edges uh, in each decision that you consider. Um, you see here uh, resulting segmentations. The colors are arbitrary, um, as always. Um, both are pretty good, but uh, you know if you look at the agglomeration order, um, that's uh, this column here, uh, you have the iterations of the algorithm color-coded. So it starts at, uh, at white and it finishes at uh, dark red. So what uh, the sum linkage criterion clustering does is it starts uh, first building this uh, segment up here. And then it builds that segment and then it builds that segment and so on. So it grows one segment at a time. Whereas if you use this average linkage criterion, you see it's com it looks completely noisy. So it does a little bit here, a little bit there. Uh, all of these clusters grow somehow concurrently. Now, which one would you think works better? I probably would have thought the first one should work better, but that's the second one. <laughs> that's uh, what we have ground truth for. Um, here's a tiny example that shows how these um, different algorithms behave. So here's a tiny sample graph for nodes A, B, C, D. Um, it is signed, so we have attractive interactions like here a plus three and there a plus six. And we have negative interactions or repulsions. They don't want to be together of minus two and of minus ten. And um, if we now use the sum criterion, well, you look at the strongest edge in absolute terms. So the highest number, no matter whether it's positive or negative, um, the highest number here is plus 11. So C and D are merged into CD. Now, they had uh, two different edges to A, namely minus 2 and plus 6. And in the sum criterion, um, well, the minus 2 and plus 6, they are summed up, and you get out a plus 4. This is uh, your new graph. 
And then uh, on your new graph, um, you again merge here the strongest, uh, or you you do you know the next most profitable thing, which is um, uh, clustering A, C, and D together. And at this point, you're left with just one repulsive edge, and you finish. There's A, C, D in one cluster, and B in the other cluster. Now, if instead of sum, you use the average criterion, the first step is the same. So these are being clustered. But now, um, the sum of minus 2 and plus 6 was plus 4. But this time, the average is being computed, which is only plus 2. So at this point, it becomes cheaper to merge these, B, C, and D. And the final result is different. Yeah? In the top, it was A, C, D versus B. And now it's B, C, D versus A. Yeah, so you see in such tiny sample graphs already that the behavior can be uh, different, even if you choose such extremely related clustering criteria, such as the sum and the average. And I'm showing a final picture um, from this paper. Uh, here you see on some part of the data uh, various clustering algorithms and you only see the errors highlighted. So here the clustering is not shown, only the errors are shown. Um, we looked just now at the sum criterion and at the average criterion and then uh, the minimum would be like uh, or, or you know, one of these is single linkage clustering, the other is uh, an opposite of that. Um, there's also a top row and a bottom row because you can make a distinction if you want to enforce repulsive constraints or not. And well, if you do that on data with ground truth, you see that there is a pretty clear winner, namely the average criterion. That's for now images from computer vision. It turns out that uh, when you use that not on neural data but on uh, you know city street views. Uh, this, the result is the same. So here, this average single linkage clustering or this average linkage clustering works really great. But of course, as you go outside computer vision, if you work on other data sets, you may find that other linkage criteria are best. And uh, well, if you do have some ground truth, then you can check. If you don't have some ground truth, you really need to look at the results and inspect and see if they seem to make sense for you. And uh, for that, you can look at the things which were being clustered, or you can use some of the dimension reduction methods that we will uh, look at on Wednesday this week. All right, this is an uh, end of excursion. This was uh, agglomerative clustering applied to signed graphs, so when you have uh, repulsive interactions. And I was very surprised that uh, there was not really much literature on that. And this is because apparently people were not previously able to estimate repulsive interactions very well. But now, thanks to neural networks, we can. Yeah? So this changes also the algorithms that we need or need to know after the neural network. OK, questions for this? Yeah? Exactly. Um, so this is the uh, kind of instance segmentation that I showed last week, where you say there are many cars, but I want to know where does one car end and the next one start. Well, that's instance segmentation. All right. Good. Now, we've seen that one of the algorithms that seems to work well on data sets are this DB scan. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about DB scan and the hierarchical variant of it, HDB scan. Um, and I'm going to talk about these a little bit. Why a little bit? Because um, 
you know, dbscan is a super successful algorithm. Yeah? I'm scrolling back up. Um, we were, I was previously asking you for, you know, what is your own favorite? By just looking at the results, I have to admit that uh, dbscan is, I think, my favorite, or, you know, this optics, I don't even know what it is, probably some variant thereof. Um, because, you know, in these examples, it all does the right thing. Um, it has, it's, uh, it was published in 1996. It was awarded after its first 20 years at a time of test award. Um, so, it's, you know, it's one of the algorithms that really has survived. Um, it has some uh, 16,000 citations. And it's being used a lot by people in data mining, in uh, database analysis, and so on. That's a good reason to talk about it. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, in its details, it's very heuristic. It doesn't really pass my um, my threshold of uh, ele elegance, I should say. I think to uh, you know to talk about it at length in this course. because I'm only really willing to talk about beautiful methods. Um, but it works really well. Yeah? So what's the intuition? And I hope that you know, maybe some of you one day will come up with an algorithm that works as well and is a bit better, is more principled. All right, so here again my sketch of, uh, this was a 2D coil cloud and I made various density estimates here. And if we're given one such uh, density estimate, let's say like this one here, um, there are two canonical ways of clustering this. Um, if we want to really start from the kernel density estimate, one is by using the modes. So that means we try and find one cluster per local maximum, and that's what mean shift does. Or we can do the thing that I've sketched on the bottom. We can threshold this density and then say um, every each resulting connected component becomes one cluster. And that is essentially what dbscan does, but it makes allowance or it has an extra treatment for the fringes of these clusters, and um, it uses something cheaper than kernel density estimate. Yeah? So uh, dbscan does the following. It, um, db scan. Um, it finds a very coarse density estimate by computing for each point the distance to the kth nearest neighbor, where k, of course, is an important parameter. And Um, points with a distance to the kth nearest neighbor, let me call this here uh, dik for point i. Uh, and now points with dik less than some threshold are high density points. And in the language of this paper and the field that it has engendered, these are called core points. And then what happens is uh, essentially uh, finding the connected components of core points. And um, assigning uh, 
nearby non core points <laughs> assigning nearby non core points to the closest cluster all right so it would uh, when we have a set of points here It would find the core points, which are maybe those, and then it would find a few points which are not core but uh, still close to the others. Those would be assigned to the cluster, and the rest would be declared noise. Okay, and then there are a zillion variants of this, and uh, you know they may differ slightly, but this is the broad idea. And what's good about this algorithm, it really works well for clusters of similar density. Even in the presence of noise. So what do I mean by cluster of similar density? In this, in this picture here, you see that, well, these are just about caught by this threshold here. So the algorithm somehow assumes that your clusters really all are of similar density. Um, what's bad is that the algorithm is not hierarchical. And it has many parameters that really make a difference. Yeah, so as you change the parameters, you can get very different clustering results. <coughs> now, this not being hierarchical, um, can be fixed. There is an algorithm called HDB scan or hierarchical DB scan. And it has one important element. which I will try and illustrate here. So we have a few example points here in a two-dimensional feature space. And I will show here how this algorithm computes the distances. And uh, this one uh, tries and uh, work also for clusters that have less, that have different densities. Yeah? And uh, for that, it corrects some of the distances that it uses. So this uses a mutual reachability distance. And it defines it as follows, as the maximum between the distance to the kth nearest neighbor of a point i, the maximum to the kth nearest neighbor of a point j, and their actual 
distance between points i and j. So what does that mean? Let's say this point here is i, and let's say this point here is j, then what they in this figure here call core distance, I have called dik, that's the distance here up to, the, in this case, the fifth nearest neighbor, and this core distance would be djk, the distance, I could even say di5 and dj5, it's the distance of i and j up to their fifth nearest neighbor. And that here is the distance dij itself. All right, and in this case, you see that uh, between these three distances, the one core distance, the other core distance, and the honest distance between the two points, the biggest of them is actually this one here. So the distance between di and j is replaced by that large core distance. Yeah, so the, this mutual reachability distance between i and j in this very specific example here would be di5. And the effect of this is that You know, in this uh, picture here, we used a uniform threshold. So the, the, the threshold on the density here, which dbscan implicitly uses, was the same throughout. And what this algorithm does is that uh, points which are in a low density region, they have a large uh, distance to their kth nearest neighbor, and uh, hence those distances are spread out. And so the the effect of this is um, the effect of using this formula here is that it increases distances both to and between points in low density regions. And then it does uh, many more things, uh, which are summarized in this text and in these pictures here. So what we've just discussed is transform the space according to the density or sparsity. <coughs> then on, the, on this resulting graph of new distances, we built the minimum spanning tree that's just as in single linkage clustering. So step number two is fine. Yeah. Um, then it becomes uh, complicated again. Uh, a cluster hierarchy is created, and this is condensed, and stable clusters are extracted. Let's look at it in pictures. These are the pictures that you've just seen. This is uh, the minimum spanning tree resulting on those artificial distances, you see that this is no longer a minimum spanning tree in the original Euclidean space. No? Otherwise, for example, I would connect these two points and not go around there. Um, then building the hierarchy is fine. This is straightforward. And now comes the black magic. Huh? So um, here the argument is that uh, sometimes we have truly, you know, profound or significant events, and sometimes we have single points that are joining a cluster. As I as I go uh, down the hierarchy, the clusters lose single points, and rather than um, these lost points, rather than declaring them clusters in their own right, they are simply lost. Okay, so what you see down here in these nodes are sort of slimmed down versions as the clusters keep losing mass. And uh, insignificant losses don't become clusters in their own right, but are just lost altogether, just noise. And now from this uh, condensed cluster tree, um, then a recipe is being used, which finds uh, in this picture, 
um, the things with largest area um, subject to a hierarchy constraint. Yeah? So if I've, if I've already selected uh, this guy here, then I cannot also select that one, or I cannot also select the yellow one because this is a child of that. All right, and then when you uh, use it, you know, in the end it gives pretty nice results with way too much, you know, tweaking uh, and arbitrary choices for my taste. Yeah? So there are many parameters, but also the way of how you do this is just very arbitrary. Um, that said, the implementation itself, um, this is, I think, the first uh, hit if you look for, uh, if you Google for HDB scan, uh, the implementation itself is very nice and uh, comes from people um, who we will hear more about on Wednesday because they've done some really nice recent work on, on, dimension, on dimensionality reduction. Good. So, in the beginning of the course, we looked at k-means and we looked at mean shift. And today we looked at a few more amongst this plethora of clustering algorithms with an emphasis uh, on agglomerative clustering. If Manuel had given today's lecture, it would have been the Gaussian mixture models, which are also another great method um, that we will uh, skip this time. Um, see you Wednesday for dimensional reduction. Thank you.